In 2021, UK man David Fuller was convicted of two murders and over 100 counts of sex with a corpse at a morgue, which he filmed. Now, of course, the media got a hold of this story and ran with it, thinking it was the best news to them since sliced bread. The salacious headlines practically wrote themselves. But we're going to look at this case from a different perspective, a clinical psychological perspective. So if you find this video interesting, please give it a like and consider subscribing. We post death and dying related videos every Friday. Now let's talk David Fuller, the case study of a necrophile. Before we begin, this is your one and only trigger warning. This video contains topics that may disturb some viewers. If that is you, please head off now and we will catch you next time. For those staying, this is not a true crime video. This is not a sensationalist news article. This is a video about the psychology of a necrophile. So I request you please put your feelings and emotions in a box under the bed for a bit and pull out your clinical and critical thinking hat instead. Additionally, this is all based off psychological analysis that I've been able to do based on the available police reports, court reports and video footage. But without actually talking to the individual, you can't make a complete analysis. Now with that, on with the video. Who is David Fuller? Okay, so we're all up to speed. Who the hell is this guy? David Fuller is a British man born in 1954, making him currently 69 years old. At the time of his arrest in 2020, he was married to his third wife, had four children, one mistress, and was living in East Sussex, England. He was described by those who knew him as quiet, a bit grumpy, a bit odd, but not necessarily creepy. At the time of his arrest, he was working as an electrician in a hospital where he had worked for most of his adult life. So now that you're up to speed with all the everyday stuff, Let's look about why he's in the news. So back in 1987, when he would have been 33 years old, he murdered two young women, Wendy Nell, 25, and Caroline Pierce, 20, in their homes over the space of two months. They were beaten around the head and strangled, and then he had sex with their dead bodies. They became known as the bedsit murders. Now at the time, the police didn't really have much to go on, and these cases went cold. That was until 2007, when the case underwent a cold case review, and with DNA profiling now available, it was determined that the same person had committed both murders, but they still didn't know who the DNA belonged to because it wasn't in the system. But long story short, in 2020, police were pretty damn sure that they had cracked the case and went to arrest David Fuller at his home. So far, nothing really out of the ordinary. So along with this arrest warrant was the warrant to search his home, which is quite normal. And that's where things went from zero to 100 real quick. While searching his home, and remember, he lived with his family, Officers uncovered numerous hard drives and floppy disks. Now, for the youngsters here who don't know what a floppy disk is, it's something that us old people used to save our computer work on, and they could usually fit like two school assignments, if that. You might know what a floppy disk looks like from the little save icon at the top of your Word document. And for those of you who have used a floppy disk in your life, don't you feel old? But back to the full at home. Officers had a quick look at what was on one of these hard drives and discovered hundreds of images of Fuller interfering with bodies at the morgue. And that was one hard drive. Once all these drives had been looked at later on, it came to, and I quote, 14 million images and 4 million videos. There were 100 hard drives, 2,200 floppy disks, 30 SIM cards and mobile phones, 1,300 CDs and DVDs, and 34,000 photographic prints, slides, negatives, and film rolls. Police managed to identify over 80 of these corpses with another 20 unidentified. All female, ages ranging between nine and 100. This occurred over a 12 year period at two different hospital morgues. As an electrician, he gained access to the morgues by using his swipe card to let himself in after other staff members had left for the day. He knew which parts of the morgue were covered by CCTV and carried out what he did out of shot. But footage from his own collection, as well as detailed records of names and ages that he made, helped police identify at least 80 people whose bodies had been interfered with. In 2020, he pleaded guilty to the two murders and guilty to a long list of sexual charges related to interfering with 100 bodies. He will be in jail for life. Now on to why I believe he's a necrophile. The necrophile. Okay, so that's the bare bones bits of information that you need to know about the case. So let's look at this from a psych perspective and there is a lot to look at. First up, let's define a necrophile. And we do have a past video on the psychological reasons someone may commit necrophilia, i.e. having a sex with a corpse, and there are many reasons. 
but a pure necrophile is rare. A necrophile has a pathological fascination with dead bodies, which often takes the form of a desire to engage with them in sexual activity, such as intercourse, i.e. they are sexually aroused by dead bodies. It is what it is, folks. If something exists, then someone will have a fetish for it. Now, most necrophiles never act on it, and there is a lot of shame that comes with this kind of fetish, even when you don't act on it. There shouldn't be, but there often is. So keep that in mind as we look at this. So fetishes usually come about from something that happens in childhood, just like every other psychological thing. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that something bad happened, just that children are pretty much born a blank slate, and how they are raised and what happens to them during childhood molds them into the adult that they will be. Now, we don't know anything about his childhood, so we can't look at that. But the murders he committed were when he was 33. So does that mean during his teens and his 20s, typically the horniest time for blokes, that he didn't act on these urges? Keep in mind, this was a time before the internet, so getting a hold of anything niche or extreme porn was very difficult. Now, he may have done nothing, but he may have done something and just wasn't caught. Typically, if someone is a sexual offender, they start with a lesser crime, maybe being a peeping Tom. And for a few years there, before the murders, police were aware in the area that someone was peering into homes at night. Was it him? We don't know, but the possibility is there, and that peeping Tom was never caught. So it's likely he had a fetish for this all his life and was never able to act on it. Obviously, it's very difficult to get your hands on a body rather than, say, a shoe if you have a shoe fetish. But being in his 30s, that would be a lot of pent-up sexual frustration. And what is the easiest way to get your hands on a fresh dead body? Regrettably, that would be to kill someone, which is what he did. And after he was arrested, while he didn't admit that he killed them for this purpose, he was adamant that he had sex with their bodies after they died, not during the attack. Now, if he was a sexual predator that loved the fight, loved the kill, he would have escalated and he would have become more brazen and craved doing it again. We see this very often with serial killers. But he only killed two women. He didn't continue which would suggest that it wasn't about power. And for those of you wondering why he had to kill these women, why not just dig up a body at a cemetery? That's a pretty good question. Likely because he was attracted to the freshly deceased, not decomposition or skeletonized bodies. But also because if you are that ashamed and get caught in the process, you probably prefer to get done for murder than digging up a body. It doesn't matter about the length of the punishment, it would be more about keeping that side of themselves a secret. Shame and hiding that shame can cause people to make some very strange decisions that may not seem logical to others. Speaking of logic, another question you may have is, if he's a necrophile, how is he able to produce four children? So part of shame and hiding that shame, whatever that may be, involves keeping up appearances so as not to draw attention to yourself. Think of it this way. Many gay men, particularly of the older generation, have children with women and did it the natural way. They had to play the family man and all that that entails. Now, having sex with a woman ain't their cup of tea, but needs must. You fantasize about George Michael and you get the job done. Is that a reference too old? Or think of it like this. A bloke who goes to the doctors and needs to give a semen sample. He ain't looking at that specimen cup thinking, yeah, baby but he gets his mind elsewhere and he gets the job done. And this is the same kind of deal with someone with a fetish, particularly a fetish that they want to hide. A necrophile may not find having sex with a living woman all that enjoyable, and it may feel weird to them, but imagination is a powerful thing, and voila, four kids. Now let's move on and talk about the police interrogation because it is very telling. It has been included in some other people's videos and I will link one of my favorites in the description, but I haven't yet learnt how to include that kind of stuff in my videos without YouTube penalizing me, so I'm sorry I haven't included it. But during the entirety of the interrogation, he is timid, his body language is closed in. He does not want to talk about the images that they found on his computer at all. And it is very obvious that this is not out of arrogance or if I don't talk to them, I can get out of this. No, he is embarrassed. He will quietly answer their questions about the murders, but the only thing he says about the images is that it wasn't a sexual thing, which is very telling because he knows he's been found out. 100% there is no getting out of this. Whatever his motive is, it won't make it any better. So he could have just kept his mouth shut. 
but he needed on a very deep insecure level for those police officers to know that it wasn't sexual because he is ashamed that it was. And this is the difference in a necrophile, someone who is sexually aroused by a corpse and someone who commits necrophilia, usually for power, as we said in our other video. The latter will often boast to the police about what they've done and how they took what they wanted from that person. They still think of that corpse as a person with feelings who would be traumatized by what they took. A necrophile doesn't see a person, they see a corpse. And yet somehow in our world, that's seen as better to have sex with a corpse for power than to be sexually aroused or have romantic feelings towards a corpse. Now I'm not saying either of those is good, but that norm is scary to think about. Now he pleaded guilty to all these charges and there are three reasons people usually plead guilty. One, they have a plea deal for an extremely lighter sentence than what they would get if they were found guilty. Two, they want to spare their families or the victim's families the pain of a trial. Or three, they don't want all the details to come out about the case. Now we don't know for sure, it may have been all three in this case, but when shame comes into these types of cases, the last one is usually the biggest reason to plead guilty when there is overwhelming evidence. You will be going to jail for a long time either way. It is best to keep as many details hidden as possible. Which brings us to the reason they had all the evidence to bury him in the first place. The videos and images. They had no idea these crimes had even happened. If he hadn't have kept them, no one would have known. So why did he keep them? Well, it is believed that he didn't start abusing corpses until 2008, so we can't blame the lack of access to porn. The internet had been up and running for a long time by then, and he would have been young and savvy enough to find the material that he wanted out there. And we know he did because police did find small amounts of niche porn in his collection. So it's more likely that he still wanted the content, but he'd keep telling himself that each time would be the last time, and it was safer to keep the recordings than to download that kind of content from the internet. Now obviously there are a lot of flaws in that plan, but we have seen this kind of logic in other fetish cases, particularly in individuals who acted during this sort of crossover period of the technology's evolution. How we view the dead body. Necrophilia is one of those things that is easy to scandalize, and it seems to be seen as one of the worst of the worst crimes, which says a lot about how we see a body. Because a dead body cannot think, feel, or have an opinion about anything. They won't be suffering PTSD after the fact like they would if they were alive. Their lives won't be falling apart like what happens after other crimes. And in this case, we saw a lot of families saying that their loved ones had been violated. But was it really their loved ones who had been violated? Can the deceased who cannot think, feel, or have an opinion be violated, assuming that to be violated you need to have awareness? Or is it the family who have been violated because their memory of their loved one has now changed in some way? Is it the families who want to believe that if their loved one was alive, then they would feel violated, but since they aren't, they take on that feeling of violation? This is one of those cases that makes you question how we see the dead and what we attribute to them. In other videos where we have talked about bodies being dug up unceremoniously, we always have some people in the comments who will say, well, I wouldn't care if it was my body. Which, if you followed that logic, then the idea of necrophilia happening to their body shouldn't bother them either, right? If that's true or not, let me know in the comments. But just like people illegally digging up a corpse, is the violation directed at the deceased corpse or towards the family? I don't know. Let us know in the comments what you think. Now I want to make this perfectly clear. None of this is to say that what he did is okay. It's not and he should be locked up. You interfere with something that is not yours to interfere with, whatever that is, that's wrong. He also murdered two people so he can rot in prison. But in cases like this, the media loves to spin their stories, but there's no explanation on why it happened. What was the motive? Similar to the previous video we did on why nurses kill, motive is an important piece of the puzzle for the public to understand. And also like that video where it's important to understand that not all nurses have ill intent, not all necrophiles have ill intent either. So let's not demonize an entire group who are already ashamed because of the horrific actions of one bloke. Further, in the description, if you want to take a look, is the independent inquiry that is occurring into Fuller's crimes and how he managed to get away with it for so long. So let us know in the comments what you think about all this. And with that, go talk death.